morning, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much, uh, the Archaeological Science Center for uh, organizing this and uh, inviting me to contribute. Uh, I could not really specifically title my talk, but just making it as inputs uh, from archaeology. Because when I started preparing for this talk, I realized that archaeology means context and context means just anything and everything around us, starting right from us as archaeologists or like as academic uh, community or even non-academic community for that matter. Uh, so this is just an overview of the uh, presentation where uh, I want to look at this colloquium, whatever we have seen till now, uh, what are the uh, facts, facts as in what is the academic research till now which has brought us uh, here. In that process, I also want to thank uh, speakers before me and even in this session because they have really shown us what all can be done with the science and what could be the context in which these science need to be understood. Uh, and so I'm actually, instead of taking the session forward, probably I'm going to take a step back to see how we have reached here and then what could be the ways forward, just some suggestion from my own uh, understanding. Uh, so this is my understanding of the colloquium so far, where we have so many questions, so many new understanding like uh, horse remains or the life expectancies or the very complex or hierarchical or egalitarian nature of the society we are talking about. And essentially the objects of our interest are the manifestation or representation of some systems which these people have been using for quite a few hundred years. Uh, just to mention that as we are reaching uh, almost 100 years of, since the first publication of these objects and this civilization to the world, probably we need to have more doubts to produce more knowledge. And uh, I believe that the uh, colloquium shows us that uh, we need to be more data centric than more notion centric when we are interpreting uh, from this data set. Uh, these are some uh, better known but maybe lesser discussed facts when we talk about endoscript. Uh, if we actually look at the academic literature, maybe like whatever it was 10 years ago, I could copy paste it in and it went up to 200 plus pages in a A4 size. Uh, there are uh, different sign inventories that are available right from 1930s since these objects started uh, being found. And as you have seen even in the previous presentation, the data is very much biased towards only two sides. And this is, you can imagine that this is very much a result of probably uh, extent of excavation, but also could be a result of actually see objects being uh, existing in those sites prominently. Uh, I hope you can read. So this is just a, a table, show. this is not these are not the all uh, people who have created sign lists, but maybe the major ones. The list is mostly compiled from uh, Postal and some other studies. Uh, interestingly, everybody had a different number of objects available when they came up with the corpus of signs, but it is not necessarily that the number of signs increase as the corpus increases. You can also see decrease of signs in between with, when people come up with different justification for lesser number of signs. And uh, let me uh, share that all the syntactic and uh, statistical studies that we do are always going to be constrained by whichever sign list we are going to use. So we have to uh, always keep that in mind when we are using the statistical techniques. And uh, this is one more about the typology of these objects, which has been complete, contemplated right from the beginning. I would say it has been contemplated. You can see that uh, miniature is a word which has been used uh, initially, then uh, probably it gets replaced by some other studies. A copper tablet is probably the only consistent term, maybe because of the use of copper being very specific material. With respect to seals, you can see uh, initially they were being called as amulets, then seals, but within seals you have a huge variety, diversity of the form, material, uh, sizes, shapes, iconography, etc. 
Now, there could be many different ways in which we can actually create this typology. So this is just a very broad uh, exercise where I'm trying to look at the main characteristics of these major categories. I'm not calling those as types, but when I'm just looking at whether the sign exists or not, whether the symbol exists or not, whether it's square or rectangular, maybe in case of seals, whereas uh, maybe in case of, again, copper tablets, whether there are uh, uh, there is an icon or there is an absence of icon. And we can imagine that there could be many different ways in which we can uh, categorize these objects. And again, here you can see red and uh, blue are the most prominent objects coming from Mohenjo-daro and Harappa. Sorry. So now when I started with this background for my own study, I realized that probably I need to go back and see how the scholarship has developed till now. And though these are like three columns, uh, there is a lot of overlap, of course, I understand those are not like, you know, strict uh, buckets of number of years, but roughly we can actually see this entire scholarship transitioning since the British or colonial period till where we are. And I have just listed very uh, prominent observations from my uh, study across the literature where in the post-colonial uh, period or when British started excavating these sites, we see a very, very uh, determinative argument about these not being uh, indigenous, these uh, definitely being foreign to the subcontinent. Or uh, we actually see, I'm again quoting this or I'm putting these in quotes, that the whole Dravidian hypothesis, which has been mentioned in Marshall's report itself in 1930s, is very much rooted in the then perceived whatever the Aryan invasion theory they were trying to think. And then as we uh, come into the independence era after say 1950s, 60s, we actually see a lot of influence of positivist or scientific mindset which is rooting into it, which was great because uh, there was a certain way of knowledge production uh, that could happen. There was a a way to cross verify falsifiability and all those tenets of scientific research. And we see a huge effort of actually creating statistical uh, ways of sign concordance analysis. And we actually see it even happening today, even today's talks, we have been seeing how these techniques can be useful. But then in last few years, I would say because of the technological advantages of maybe chemical analysis, uh, stone content analysis, or even electron microscope analysis, we have started seeing a lot of research into the typology of these objects, where we could see where the steatite was sourced from, or how these objects were being carved, etc. So these are very interesting transitions to see in, as a as an, uh, student in the archaeology uh, domain. So this is just an overview, and in these phases, we see that the scholarship is you know, kind of getting uh, influenced or being conditioned because of the maybe archaeological theories at that point in time, maybe socio-political environments or the technologies that are available at that point in time. Uh, and we actually see that there is a very big disconnect when it comes to decipherment and typology. And I have just try to highlight the words because we may not be able to read everything. But uh, we actually see when we are searching for linguistic patterns, we are probably not very much looking into the typology or the material details of these objects. Or uh, when we are looking at the decipherment efforts, when I say decipherment, it's mostly not really knowing the language, but the syntaxes. Uh, we are looking at all the data and maybe going say from like general to specific. When we are looking at typologies, it's more on a smaller data set and extrapolating to what might be happening in the larger context. Uh, the purpose of this slide is actually humanizing these objects because we are talking about these objects all the while, at least in this session. And when I'm actually handling these objects as a human being because uh, it's people just like us who were using these objects 4,000 years ago. So I'm just trying to experience these objects, put them on a graph paper to show, show their respective scales and imagine what it could be. So then I start searching for the context of these objects and I realize that uh, even before I go into the archeological context, there is probably a meta context that I'm going to face. 
And so when I went for a field work in Gujarat, on one of the sites, this is a pile of potsherds. And then I had a friend who was not from archaeological domain and she was completely thrilled to find so many in one location. And then we realized this is a discard area of the excavation that has happened few years ago. Now we need to keep in mind that when we visit the archaeological sites, maybe which, were, which are 4,000 year old, we are probably visiting something on the similar lines in a very different extrapolated world. And this slide is probably the extrapolation in, that, in the past. This is a mound in Dolavira which has happened because of the soil being dumped from the excavation itself. So we can see the site was being formed again and again even when it was being excavated. And then this is again an example when uh, from a site I actually find potsherds which have been uh, uh, documented but then maybe discarded for some reason or the other. And then I'm finding it probably four or five years later and then I see something written on it which I can read at this point in time because it may be English, it's Roman, so it makes sense to me. I'm just trying to put everything in context to the Indus uh, inscribed objects. Uh, and then I move to the archaeological reports because that is where most of the information is coming from at least say for the historic excavations or when I am not able to excavate more material. And uh, we actually see today when I am reading I actually see a lot of uh, uh, conditioning or biases that have, pro that have uh, come into this uh, even the reports that are being written if we start reading those with a lens. And uh, this, uh, the picture is just to create a graphic view of how the first announcement was done uh, in the British uh, daily. And then again, one more example when the, we are actually seeing when history is dividing the archaeology. So these corpus which are very, very popular amongst at least the Harappan uh, archaeologists, uh, I was reading about how these two different, uh, you know, corpuses were created and we actually get to know that the distribution that happened at the time of partition that which object should go to Pakistan, which object should remain in India, it was completely random. So today if I actually want to go and study these objects physically, if I actually want to major these objects for advanced studies, I'm restricted to a very random set which is probably available, easily accessible. And then finally we have people who are excavating the site through whom the objects are coming to us. So this is the site for them is their bread and butter which is an academic interest for us. So that is a very important context. And so I just want to grab your attention, we through these uh, experiences I realized that uh, archaeological evidence comes to us with lot of uncertain uncertainties and ambiguities and there is this very beautiful article by uh, American archaeologist named John, John Garrow, maybe many of us you know about it, uh, know about her and uh, what I realized is uh, we are always looking at the derivative aspects of the material, the archaeology, uh, we are always digging local but we want to interpret it in the global context, global framework, uh, context matters everywhere to everyone and I realized it that even to me it is very important because I realized that I'm looking at this from maybe a social sciences and humanities point of view more than a archaeological point of view. And uh, so these are just, I'm just, I'm not going to read these but these are the highlighted points from uh, Gero's article where she uh, shows that when we want to reach a conclusion or we want to infer something, there are various mechanisms that we uh, employ in the data set or in the interpretations which lead, which help us to reach closure and like data cleaning, uh, stretching the data, pushing the data and I'm sure this is applicable not just in archaeology but in lot of domains but in archaeology I'm interested in how these things happen. And then she always argues that we must honor ambiguity because that is what is going to help us 
uh, understand more, interpret more, or basically increase our knowledge in anything about the material or the society in the past. And then I started to un relate these to, yeah, uh, how I, we can actually see it in the uh, archaeology that is happening, not necessarily the decipherment studies of the science. And we see with respect to sizes, we actually see these uh, seals per se appearing in lot of different sizes. The CISI corpus that I showed earlier, it creates five buckets of these sizes only for square unicorn seals. Now there is no justification as to why only unicorn seals. There is no justification as to why those five or six buckets. What is the reason for those measurements to create those sizes? This is an iconographic study. Uh, Uta Franka was already here uh, for the talk in, on the first day, I suppose. She creates these iconographic groupings. She also takes cognizance of the previous research that was done. Uh, and then we do have few uh, research which actually hesitate to call this particular icon as unicorn and they continue to call this icon as boss. And uh, I believe from archaeological point of view, these are very interesting contrasts that we must look at. And then uh, we already saw few studies in this session or yesterday also. And these are very interesting because these are showing us, uh, I'm sorry for repeating or showing their work here, but they help me uh, extend my argument that we are looking at ambiguities or from a theoretical point of view, we are looking at like a post-processual exercises within uh, these studies. Uh, we, they are helping us to create multiple interpretations or uh, understand the user persona of these objects. One caveat or one limitation that we need to keep in mind is that uh, majority of these studies uh, are, uh, I mean, we will face uh, constraints of advan advanced measuring instruments uh, which are being used or employed in these studies. And then we had inputs from Ameri, I don't need to reiterate what she mentioned. But uh, again, this is multiple interpretative scenario. Uh, interestingly, she also gives us insight into an epistemological steps that she is taking towards uh, whatever interpretation uh, she is giving. And then uh, from Andrea's work, uh, this is interesting because so called apparently similar looking signs are being separated based on their positional frequencies, depending on which objects they appear on and which site they appear on. So there is a lot of contextual information that is put in to really separate out the signs, yeah. And this is another interesting one where we actually see a very localized interpretations of the signs for, uh, to, uh, in this context it is very much a affordance of the object that we have, which is a volume that, could, that a uh, jar could accommodate and relating it to the signs. Now as we come to typology, this is a screenshot from uh, POSIL. Uh, we actually have serious concerns raised by him in 1996 to actually have a comparative nomenclature and perceived usage with uh, Mesopotamian material. And uh, then are we actually seeing example of stretching the data or pushing the data to fit into some larger uh, picture? And so these are just few efforts from my side when I'm trying to negotiate with this existing scholarship, negotiate this uh, material at hand. Uh, let me put it this way, material, very restricted material, which I could see in the uh, ASI repository. Most of it is based on the photographs or some help from uh, Andreas using his database. This is a case study from Mohenjo-Daro's DKG mound, which is apparently uh, one of the biggest repositories of this database. The uh, pie charts actually show you uneven excavation that has happened on this mound. So if we go line by line in the excavation report, we actually see Market describing that he is going deeper up to all five cultural periods, cultural periods defined by him based on his understanding of the stratigraphy. Or in some cases, he is not really going that deep. Maybe he stops at late two or intermediate one period, etc. So we are looking at a very uneven, uh, un, uh, inconsistent excavation on the mound. 
yeah and i was just trying to create a hypothetical scenario of what when and what if we actually decipher will we actually stop digging we will not because we un probably understand that writing is also maybe one way of or just one perspective of some subset of the society so probably we will still continue the archaeological aspect even if we decipher so yeah thank you very much <laughs>